Hey, do you have any questions for him first? Nope. Let's do this. All right. Uh, okay, we did um, a thing with Adam Marcus earlier. Okay. Uh, talking about Jason Goes to Hell. And he said that he had the idea for Elias Voorhees. And I know you said that uh, Elias, that the dad was supposed to be in part six. Mm -hmm. So did you come up with him or did Adam come up with him? Well, I don't know who came up with Elias. I never called him Elias. I just called him you know, Jason's father. Um, and showed up literally at the end of uh, Jason Lives um, to kind of just kind of set up, you know, the, the fact that he's got a father and his father is far more evil than what we would have expected. Um, but because part five left the audience feeling that Tommy Jarvis might be the next Jason and Paramount was concerned if that would like, you know, mess up that 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 whole vibe that Jason's back that there he was afraid that if people you know went oh shit and the next movie is going to be about Jason's dad and not Jason, so we ended up having to take it out. But if you you know if you get the uh, the Signet book that is you know Jason lives the actual you know book version of the script, um, it has that scene in there, and of course it's in you know the original draft and all that. Somewhere along the line, and I don't know, it, maybe, it, well, maybe it was Adam that, that came up with the Elias. I saw it years and years later in a comic book um, of, of, that was about uh, Pamela and her relationship with this big, burly, you know, redneck kind of guy, you know, Elias. Um, very different than the version I had of, of how I was going to do him had we shot that scene. Um, but yeah, I, I, as I said, I don't know, you know, how that changed. And now that they're doing um, the fan film Vengeance, you know, they're using the name Elias and they have CJ, you know, playing Elias Voorhees. And he's he's a little closer to what I had envisioned with the long coat and a little more, you know, evil. OK, that's I would have loved to see where that went with if y'all actually got the chance to do it. That would have been cool. Yeah, yeah, but as I said, it was just purely because of the fear that, you know, it, it would be perceived that the next movie wasn't going to be, you know, a pure Jason movie. And that was um, cool. Uh, in part six, I know you had to switch uh, the guy who played Jason. Uh, the one in the woods who did the triple decapitation, that wasn't C.J. Graham, right? No, that was uh, uh, Dan Bradley, who was a uh, and uh, he also, you know, the idea was is that he could do all the coordinating of the stunts and play Jason. Um, and so that's kind of the way that we went into it. And then Paramount made this decision after they saw the dailies. They just didn't like the way he moved. And, you know, he was a little bit too right. cool for the, <laughs> for the uniform. So um, they took our second choice, which was CJ, and sent him out and... You know, I felt horrible about it because I really like Dan and he's a great guy. But Dan's gone on to have an amazing career as a second unit director and does all those Born to Death movies and the James Bond movies, all those great car, you know, crashes and chases and all that shit. That's Dan Bradley. And I mean, he's an incredibly talented guy. That's awesome. Oh, well, sounds like it worked out for him. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And say, and CJ was, was perfect. I mean, you know, I, I I love the fact he sort of redefined Jason as a much more, um, you know, almost like Terminator, unstoppable. You know, I bring him back with a lightning bolt and he's got to, to me, move less like a human being and more like something that's a monster, you know. I right. love that he I went say, uh, uh, One thing I did is I seen a documentary a while back that you were a part of. I, I've seen so many. I can't remember the exact name, but in it you were saying that you almost set the movie to be up in black and white. So I actually did that. And I got to be honest, so beautiful in black and white. Yeah. It reminds me of the old school universal films from the twenties yeah. <laughs> or thirties. I should say you got it. You got it, brother. That's exactly what I was doing. I was shooting it. I, I wanted it to look, cause those are the movies that I loved. And, you know, obviously, you know, I right. still, the Frankenstein, how to reanimate somebody with a bolt of lightning. And that's all was part of my childhood. So uh, I think it was, who was it? Somebody, I think it was, I read George Lucas. 
at some point early in my career that, you know, he always talked about trying to make the movies have enough contrast that if you took the color out, they still would look cool in black and white. And I thought, right. well, that's perfect for this. So we lit it in such a way so that, yeah, if somebody did want to, you know, experiment, try that, it would look great. So, I mean, yeah, I, 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 I would love to release a version that's just purely black and white like they did with Parasite. That would be awesome. Right. What was uh, it like working with Tom Matthews? <laughs> Great. I mean, we are still incredibly good friends, as obviously with CJ. I mean, all the cast. It's, you know, we, we stay in touch. We Facebook. We send messengers. We send jokes. I mean, we've been doing this now for 35 years. And, of course, at the conventions, you know, always put us together at the tables, you know, throw, throwing spitballs at one another. You know, it's just like we're we never we never stopped uh, that connection that we built on the movie. Um, and the fact that the movie's been so successful certainly has helped um, that, you know, they keep asking us to come back and, you know, host screenings or, you know, do the conventions and, you know, sending things in to sign and stuff. So it, it's really been, you know, wonderful. Uh, and Tom was. You know, and he walked in the door. I knew he was the guy. I mean, there's just no two ways about it. Same thing with Jennifer. You know, I walked in and said, oh, God, and she and Tom yes. are going to be great together. You just sort of know it, you know, with certain people. Um, so, yeah, all, everybody. I, I just, you know, loved working with these guys. I've been, I was fortunate enough to meet him at a horror convention. It was the time of my life. He was so nice. And then when I leave, he was like, hey, Jay, I can smell your brains. I almost <laughs> melted to the floor. <laughs> Yeah, sounds great. Uh, I was watching uh, one of the document, uh, the Crystal Lake Memories documentary. I'm pretty sure, and uh, it was on part six when you were talking about all the Universal monsters. Mm -hmm. and I'm 18. I was born in 2002, so uh, I never really watched those because I was like, "Ew, black and white movies." Yeah. But um, when you started talking about them and you said that Frankenstein was the inspiration for, uh, Jason, I, I knew the Frankenstein movies. Like I watched, uh, that one with, uh, Robert De Niro and, um, I, I enjoyed that one, but I never watched the original ones. Yeah. So I went, uh, because of your recommendation, I went and watched them and I actually loved them. I, I, I bought that legacy collection box set. Oh, that's great. Yeah. yeah that's great. They're, they're awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, by today's standards, obviously, you know, things are much more tame. But you got to know, you know, when those things were really released in like the early 30s, I mean, they scared the shit out of people. Frankenstein gave people nightmares. Oh, yeah. You know, and Dracula and the, and the Wolfman, I mean, because it was that, you know, early sound, you know, it was just, you know, that was kind of coming into its own and the imagery of something like that really got to people yet I obviously didn't experience that but as a kid growing up in the 50s um, you know it was on TV all the time uh, and in fact they used to run those movies nine o'clock every school night <laughs> so instead of going to bed I was like sneaking in and turning them on so by the <laughs> from Monday to Friday by Friday I could do all the dialogue you know I knew everything so they really were kind of a part of my childhood and you know, I have a great, you know, affinity for them and they're like friends too. I mean, you know. Yeah. But I'll be honest. So who are uh, who are some of your your biggest influences for directing? For directing? Um yeah. it's a kind of, of of people actually. Um you know, I love movies. I love movies literally of every genre and anytime, you know, now I'm teaching uh, as well, part time at a, at a university out here. So I'm working with young up and coming filmmakers, you know, from the age of 18, like you and, and up to about 22. And, it, you know, I love it because there's just like, you know, they have such an excitement, particularly for the films of the 80s. And so, you know, I try to pass on that same thing of, you know, take all those things, steal from whoever, you know, that you love. Right. And make it and because it's going to be yours regardless because you're going to take from all these things that you know whether it's paranormal activity or whether it's um you know the conjuring the things that that you've seen and hopefully in the theater that you know had an influence on you you know go for it and then you start to come up with your own kind of stories how i how can i take that and put it in this 
Um, so I was the same way growing up. I mean, obviously, the I didn't know anything about who directors were when I was watching these movies. But once I started to actually, you know, study it, um, I have everything from obviously Scorsese and Stanley Kubrick and all those, you know, you know, heavy duty, you know, major influence directors. Yes. And then times just the, you know, the little independent guys, you know, you see something somebody does and you go wow that's really cool um and yeah, i try to let everything kind of influence me you know one way or the other you know a huge person that i kept in contact with over the years was frank capra frank capra did it's a wonderful life which comes on every christmas and you know people say well how would a horror director get anything from that guy and i go well i wasn't just a horror director i also wanted to make movies that made people laugh you know made you right. emotional and as you see in Friday the 13th, you know, there's there's comedy, there's characters, hopefully, that you like. I wasn't just going for people that, you know, somebody would be in the back of the theater going, yeah, kill the bitch. You know, <laughs> I wasn't into making that kind of a movie. I'd rather have you go, oh, shit, I loved her. You know, I wish she hadn't tore her head off. You know, I was hoping she'd make it, you know. So I was kind of going more for that. And that's the kind of influences from Capra and people like that where you make hopefully characters that the audience sits there and kind of relates to and they make you laugh a little bit and you know you identify so yeah the influences kind of came from all kinds of things and of course exorcist huge influence halloween huge influence so those are all you know all part of the kind of you know composite of of, of different directors and different types of movies that, that's what i love about jason lives honestly is I know most of the movies were always rooting for Jason to get all the kills and the, you know, and I understand it. I love Jason Voorhees. I have him tattooed on me. I'm wearing yeah. your awesome. mask. <laughs> <laughs> and but the, the, your movie actually really had character development in a lot of your characters. And you learned a little bit about them. Like, that's yeah. what I appreciate about your film style. It's not just about Jason. There's so much more going on. And the Easter eggs in particular were amazing. Like the Karloff store. I knew yeah. that when I was a little kid that it was a reference to Boris Karloff. Like, without a doubt, I knew this. And the yeah. Cunningham Road I caught on. <laughs> and the yeah. James Bond slash. And the James Bond. Yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. James Bond slash. That, that's like one of the highlights of the movie, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, it sort of sets the, I mean, my intention was to kind of set the tone for, okay, this is not going to be your normal Friday the 13th. We're going to try to do something different. And I'll be honest, boys, I thought, you know, people were going to hate it. I thought the fans were going to go, oh, man, he's fucked it up with the comedy and all the rest of that. But that first few screenings, you know, that we had, it was like, my God, this is great. But we were suffering the sins of the previous Friday because a lot of people didn't come. Because they're going, I don't want to see this. You know, the last one wasn't even Jason. And, you know, I don't even know if right. it's going to happen this right. time. Plus, Aliens, the, you know, the, 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 the Jim Cameron movie had just opened the week before. So that was blowing people away. So it's like they were going to see that the weekend that we were opening. So, you know, we came in number two instead of number one because Aliens was so big. So, it, you know, the sort of the box office buzz wasn't as, as big as, as we all hoped it would have been. But as time has gone on, it's kind of been, you know, one of the more beloved ones, which is, you know, what I, I'm more than happy about because, I you know, I love every generation comes along and discovers it and says, man, I just love that, you know. You watch any oh, absolutely. Everybody My daughter's first love. My daughter's favorite movie is Jason Lives. They, we go camping every year in October. We have to watch that movie. It's like a requirement from her. <laughs> Even she gets the movie and how great it is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's great because it, it, it like as I said, with the Frankenstein and, and Dracula and all that stuff, I mean, those were like friends. They were like heroes, you know. I, I'd run around... Right. You know the alleys in my neighborhood. You know, like the Wolfman, and jump up on things. And you know, I had total identification with that. And all these films that we thought in the '80s that we were just, you know, eh, these are not as good as the other ones, and then we're not making the great shit that the '70s was making. But you know, as the time's gone on, I mean, obviously, you know, Freddy and Michael Myers and Chucky and Pinhead, and you know, you. It goes on and on. And of course, Jason now are the same iconic movies that, you know, those universal monsters were. And they yeah, mean more to call it the bronze age of, of horror. That's what I've heard quite a few times. It's like the slasher era is like the bronze era. Obviously, the 
you know, the Universal films were the gold and then Hammer films were the silver. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Hammer films had a big influence, too, because I used to ditch school um, and and go out to Santa Monica uh, in, in L.A. and where they would uh, open movies at noon. Uh, and so I would th those that's where I saw all the Edgar Allan Poe, Roger Corman movies, you know, and the uh, Hammer movies and all that, you yes. know, British horror stuff. And I was supposed to be in class and I'm sitting there in that theater, you know, getting all that stuff. You know, this that was my education. Yeah. Awesome. I do have one thing. Um, we did a, quite a few interviews in the past. And one thing that always gets brought up is the mask in part six. Uh, a friend of ours, Michael, he was kind of wondering if the mask that you use, was that supposed to be the part five mask where like Tommy Jarvis might have rehauled it or something along those lines or? Well, you know, that's all of these things, guys, are so like when they're making the movies and think about, I mean, back then we really thought these things would play a couple of weeks, maybe, and then disappear. And you never right. hear it wasn't like there was, you know, VHS and laser discs and, of course, now DVDs and Blu-rays and streaming and all that. So it right. they really, to us a very short life. So nobody paid a whole lot of attention. And I mean, obviously, starting right from the first Friday the 13th to the second, huge time gap, you know, and <laughs> Jason's grown up, but uh, uh, what's her face? Uh, uh, Adrian King's character, I'm blanking on her name. Uh, uh, Alice. Yeah. Alice. Yeah, she's not Alice. Yeah, she's not changed. I mean, <laughs> it's the same girl, yet Jason is now this, you know, big. So they just figured, okay, we're going to do an, another one because the first one was so successful. We can't make it be about some, you know, deformed boy. So let's just, you know, grow him up. What does he look like? Oh, we'll put a bag over his head. No one's going to know, you know. And so people have always been trying to figure out what that timeline is between that and every movie. Yes. If you look at the masks and line them up, they all look a little different because every guy that makes them says, well, I want to put a little myself into this. And I think right. I, you right. guys could probably correct me if I'm wrong, but I think part five is the only one that has like the blue thing on the top there. Yeah. Uh, so yes. he has the blue on the sides. Yeah. But I had Tommy carrying, you know, the, the one with the red. And I mean, I, I didn't know where he got it. But he had it, and he was going to throw it in there to burn it along with Jason, so the whole thing would hopefully kill his his psychosis and his nightmares. So I right. was just back to where we left off on part four, and kind of you know just pick it up from there. You know, we mentioned the institution, but other than that, it's not you know I, I wasn't really following in the in the footsteps of of the previous one. That's what okay. I yeah we can. Did, <laughs> did, uh, did like Paramount or Frank Mancuso Jr. tell you to like skip five or was that just your your decision? Like, don't even mention it. Well, we we talked about it. Um, John Shepard, we thought was going to reprise the role of Tommy. Um, so that was sort of in, you know, in the back of my mind that when I was writing it, that, OK, that's that's what Tommy looks like, John Shepard. Um, and, you know, he basically said that well, if you want to include some of it, you can, you know, it's up to you. It really doesn't matter to us. All I care about is bring Jason back from the dead. And I said, and what else? Anything else you want to do, just bring <laughs> Jason back. So that literally was my marching orders. So I, you know, I came up with all that, you know, the, what are the James Bond thing and these other touches. And I thought, well, let's, Let's pick up where, as far as we know, he's he's dead and he's in a coffin and Tommy's going to, you know, go get him. And then when uh, there was issues with John Shepard doing it and I never got clear whether he was not doing it for religious move reasons. He was not doing it because he just didn't want to do another one of those or his agent was asking too much money. And Frank Mancuso said, nope, sorry, Charlie, um, that, you know, we ended up with Tom Matthews, which I was really thrilled because he was closer to what I had envisioned, you know, for, you know, him being a little more macho, a little more aggressive, you know, and, and of course the romantic with Megan. Did you ever think about bringing Corey Feldman back? Like, did that ever cross your mind? It didn't be, because we, you know, for those people who were following the storyline, you know, he had, he had grown up and he now looked like John Shepard. 
So I didn't want to go that backwards. And I also, you know, it's because if people were following it, it was like, okay, yeah, it's a different Tommy, but it's Tommy Jarvis. And he's, you know, just a little bit older than the John Shepard character. So, you know, we never said how long he actually stayed in the institution. But yeah, no, no Corey, um, you know, never really kind of came into the mix. All right. Um, well, um, with the whole comedy aspect to it, uh, was it your idea to go like, go that, like, bring the comedy to it? Or did Frank Mancuso Jr. tell you to do it? No, he was afraid of the comedy. Right. He it. said to me, are you going to make fun of Jason? And I said, no way, sir. No, no, no. Jason is going to be scary. Those sequences are going to be intense. It's going to be everybody else that's going, ooh, I wonder if it's Jason, you know, and, you know, the card game that they played. I mean, they, it's like they've heard of this guy, but by this point, the town has tried to forget about it. They've changed the name to Forest Green, you know, and so there was this whole thing, obviously, when Tommy starts you know, talking about this, the sheriff's going, oh, no, we don't need this Jason shit. We're trying to forget about it, you know, and stay the fuck away from my daughter. You know, so, you know, I I was trying to add sort of those other dramatic elements as well as having a sense of humor about it. But there was no nothing funny about what Jason was doing, you know, and, and he had a solid agenda in this one, which was Tommy in that, you know, didn't mean to, but ended up bringing him back from the dead. So he, you know, his ass is dead. Jason is heading for this guy and anybody in his way goes down. I don't know. So it all kind of comes to that fight at the end where Tommy's trying to put him back in the in the lake and Jason's trying to kill Tommy. So, you know, it they it had much, you know, of a stronger motivation for each character, you know, in that way. And that that's kind of more what I wanted to go for with the, you know, with humor and you know, hopefully some stuff where it's sort of like you, you feel bad when somebody, you know, actually gets killed. There's yeah, a- you're right on that. Like you say, it's all the characters. <laughs> there, uh, there's a theory that I've had about part six ever since the first time I watched it. And I was going to ask you about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a little girl in the camp and her name is Nancy. Right. Um, oh, Nancy. She's, she, she screams and when the two counselors run in there and uh, she said that there was somebody trying to kill her and she was uh, she's like, oh, you've had a bad dream. And he's like, she uh, she said, uh, no, it was real, like on TV. Right. I was wondering, is that the Nancy from like the kid version of Nancy from A Nightmare on Elm Street? And like y- you guys did that to set up for Freddy versus Jason. Really good question. Um, no, to be honest with you. Um, th- this was, uh, little Nancy was sort of a version of my ex-wife who was the one who played Elizabeth and because she was, you know, uh, you know, had this sort of innocence and I wanted to kind of go for, uh, the little Nancy character that there was, you know, there, there's some things in this movie that I've, I'm setting up for my sequel, Jason Never Dies, which I've, you know, written and it's sitting there, you know, taking place nowhere <laughs> until it's shot. <laughs> and and uh, what's his face? You know, the writer to work out their differences. And it's been nine years and God knows when. But I tried to set up some things and and the, some of the stuff that goes on there with little Nancy in that scene is part of that setup. Um, so she just kind of represented to me the the two things for, for the audience. One is Jason, you know, is so fascinated with her. It's like there's something going on there with her. And secondly, it's like, was was he looking at this child, like remembering, you know, when he was at that camp and he was, you know, a kid and you know, and there's just something, you know, he's, he's faced with pure innocence for the first time. And it also was a little tribute to Frankenstein again with the little girl and the, the flowers, you know, and the, but obviously she doesn't have the, the situation occur that what happened to that girl. Um, so there, it, it really was a way for the audience to go, Oh my God, he put children in this movie. He's not going to kill children. Is he? And I wanted that to be something that, you know, people were concerned, you know, that we would do. Um, but of course I had no desire to do that. I just wanted them to be the thing that had to be protected you know, regard counselors really had their hands full, you know, to to save their own lives, you know, and these kids. 
like I, that I, extra danger factor that, that makes it scarier yeah that's what i thought yeah that's what i was going for i didn't think we could get kids i thought maybe the parents were gonna go no we ain't putting our kids in that movie you know but the parents you know we're all jason fans so you know, we're at five in the morning shooting that scene of Tommy being drug out of the lake and all those kids are there and I'm going to their parents. You sure you're all right? No, they're having a great time. You know, <laughs> so, you know it worked out great. Like you were saying with um, everybody was uh, afraid, like, are, is you going to kill kids? My, uh, I have a little nephew that just started watching the Jason movies and I was showing it to him, but he had already watched the new uh Halloween movie from mm-hmm. 2000, and he saw where Michael uh, strangled that 12 year old boy in the in the car. And my nephew looked at me and he's like, "Is he gonna do what Michael Myers did?" And I'm like, "Just watch." Yeah, yeah, we're we're in a different age now, boys. It's like you know, before you would never ever be able to do that. I mean, I I you know, it's hard enough with the kills that the motion picture rating board would say, "Nope, nope, you're not gonna do that. You're not gonna do that." And I was pretty tame in my kills because I was trying to make them supernatural kills, something that no human could actually do, you know, punch out a heart, twist a head all the way and pull it off, you know, squeeze a head till the skull break. I mean, you know, he was super, super strong. Um, but, you know, certain things, if you you know cross that line, then I mean, if we showed you know that happening, actually happening, they, they, they would make us cut it out anyway. Yeah. Uh, now, you know, people seem to, you know, they're still, you know, don't like it. It's uncomfortable, but they somehow allow filmmakers to to do that. Mm-hmm. Like, um, did you have a lot of issues with the MPAA, Tom? Yeah, we did. We had nine screenings. Um, and guess, oh. maybe you know this, but guess what kill they picked on more than anything else that I had to keep cutting down and cutting down of all the kills? What would you think it would be? Maybe the oh, triple head decapitation. No, no, they ju- they jumped on that really quick and just we couldn't show the, actually the heads getting cut and dropping. We could just show them hitting the ground, but yeah, that was cut very gotcha. quick. But there's one that I just fighting and fighting and it, you know every time they made me trim a little more out till suddenly nine you know times later they finally o- okayed it. The sheriff's back bend. Ah, that's what I'm. Oh gonna- yes. Yes. No, no blood. You know, you didn't see anything, you know, that was objectionable. But the intensity of what was happening, you know, so bothered them, you know, that they kept saying, no, you got to take a few more frames out of that. You got to make it a little shorter, a little shorter. And it still works. I didn't really sacrifice, you know, what I would, I wanted it to be. But, you know, right. it was it was ridiculous. And I said, you know, to, to Frank Bancuso, I said, why did they keep picking on that? And he said, well, they're saying it's cumulative. By the time we get to that one, we've seen so much that this thing is just like, okay, enough already. And I go, but that's stupid. I mean, usually your best kills, your biggest kills are at the end of movies anyway. You know, the biggest fight, right. the confrontation. And this was, you know, this was an old gag that I did with Dick Van Dyke years ago on, on, a, on a show. And I, it, was a, it was a comedy bit where he, was a, he went to a chiropractor who bent him back like that and did all these things. And so I was doing it for comedy then. And then I thought, well, wait a minute, what if I take that idea and make it look absolutely horrible that you're really doing that to somebody? So yeah, I was kind of stealing from myself, but I never thought they would have an objection to that. I thought, oh, we can get away with this. This is, you know, you're not seeing no blood. Yeah, that was a really good kill too. Like the way you hear, you don't have to see it just to yeah. hear you're like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, with as much nudity as there is in the rest of them, was it your idea to make this, uh, to make part six with no nudity? Or was it the MPAA? No. You had, uh, a, you had a new Tom Friendly, Brad. <laughs> Tom Friendly. Yeah, that was the compromise. Um, to be honest, Darcy DeMoss, you know, who's obviously a very sexy girl, and I knew she had done kind of other things. Uh, you know, where I believed that she was partially naked or maybe told, I don't, you know, I, I don't know because I didn't meet her until she came in for the audition. But on the day we were shooting the motorhome, it's in the script that she's got her top off. You know, she's on top of him and, and you know, doing the thing. And um, I said, 
you know, okay, you ready to go do this? And she goes, do I really have to take my top off? And I go, why? You know, is that a problem? And she goes, yeah, it kind of is. I said, well, what do you mean? And she goes, I, I don't, I, I just, I don't want to kind of get into that kind of thing, be known for that. And I kind of don't, you know, I didn't sign anything to sort of allow that to happen. And I go, look, it's not as important to me as it's been to everybody else. You know, it's a comedy thing because Jason's, you know, watching this thing bounce and stuff. So, yeah, if, you know, if we see your breasts or we don't see your breasts, you know, I'll take the flack, you know. So, yeah, I'd rather have you be comfortable. And I, I wanted to be respectful to her both as a, as a woman and as an actress that if she wasn't comfortable, I didn't want her doing it. So I let it go. But, you know, as the years have gone on, I've had so many dudes go, you know, oh, fuck, man, what happened? You know, there's like no tits in your And I go, <laughs> you know, and I said, you know, there, there could have been, but I was trying to be respectful to the lady. You know, that's awesome, you being respectful. That's a lot more than most people can say. <laughs> well, you know, when I you think of the previous movie um, that, that, he, you know, he had come out of porn and softcore stuff. And so he had so much sex, you know, in part five uh, that, you know, that they picked on more than anything else. And his version was, you know, all the heavy duty sex. So I thought, you know, well, it's, it's a big contrast, obviously, you know, from the way he did one to the way I was doing it. Right, right. What was it like to work with Horseshack? Because my dad showed me the the Welcome Back Cotter show all the time. Yeah. And I was, That's Horseshack, ain't it? Yeah, um, yeah. He was he was one of those people. I didn't I didn't envision somebody like him in the part. To be honest, I don't know who quite I envisioned. But um, when they brought him up, because he didn't actually come in audition, I thought, you know, that's kind of cool um, because you know we we know he's funny. We know he's like a good sidekick. Uh, kind of, you know, type of character. And I was thinking, too, of like the movie Rebel Without a Cause, you know, with James Dean and Sal Mineo. And it had that kind of vibe to me, you know, like the cool guy and then the, the nerdy guy that looks up to the cool guy and stuff. And and then, of course, the comedy that that obviously, you know, he could put to it, Ron Palillo. Um, so, you know, it was it was great fun. But I mean, literally, I only got to work with him, you know, two days, uh, the, the one in the in the car, the drive and then the, you know, the thing in the in the graveyard. So I didn't get, you know, to be as, as you know, close with him. And then unfortunately, you know, he passed away a number of years ago. So he's not at any of the conventions and things. So, yeah, unfor you know, it was unfortunate it just didn't get to, you know, keep that friendship. Yeah. He seemed like a cool dude. He was. Yeah, he was very funny. Very nice guy. Was you ever op, uh, offered to do any of the other sequels? Oh, yeah. Um, immediately. Uh, when soon as we finished and the movie was screened and we actually got some good reviews, which had never happened before. Um, and, you know, they may they may have said, well, it's another Friday the 13th. But in this one got to say we liked the characters it was funny it was fun it was like a you know thrill ride it wasn't usual just waiting for people to die so based on all that uh frank mancuso came to me about a week you know later after the movie opened and he said all right let's talk about part seven and i go i don't have a clue what to do you know i mean i guess we could pick up you know the the father thing and do that and he goes eh, what else you got and I go, I really, I put everything I know, Frank, into this, you know, I really wanted it to have all these things. So I'm not saying I can't do it, but let me give it some thought. He goes, okay, while you're thinking, how about this? Freddie meets Jason. And I go, that would be great. Frankenstein meets the wolf man. Shit. Yeah, that would be great. And he said, well, I'm working on it. I said, you really think New Line will let you and, and Paramount, you guys would work this out? He goes, we're trying. So he came back a few weeks later and said, nah, they won't let it go. Uh, we couldn't make a deal. So, you know, do you got anything else? Have you thought about it? And I went, um, no, I was hoping that was going to happen. And so I jokingly said, well, you guys have Cheech and Chong here. How about Cheech and Chong meet Jason? And he laughed and he, you know, he said, I don't know the same audience. And I went, what are you talking about? That is the same audience. Everybody smokes weed. They go in there, you know, <laughs> to party. You know, obviously, we to me, we'd get both audiences, you know, the, the Cheech and Chong audience and the Jason audience. He goes, no, I think the Cheech and Chong audience 
you know, they just come to laugh. They're not going to want the horror and stuff. And the horror audience aren't going to want the picture to stop for teaching Chong routines. And I go, well, you know, you're the boss. I, I that just, you know, what I would think would be fun. So years later, I mean, maybe it was like two years later or something. I guess I, I, I said that in some interview and, you know, it kind of went viral. Everybody goes, you know, oh, we could have had a Cheech and Chong Jason movie. And then I heard an announcement that those guys were talking about getting together and doing a horror movie. Um, so I don't know if it, it, you know, got them into that vibe. It just happened to be a coincidence. But, yeah, that was that was kind of it. So all, you know, cut to I don't know how many years ago was Jason meets Freddy. Uh, when I heard about it and um, I had a different take on it and I went to New Line and they just, you know, kind of basically said, no, we want this to be this way. And I went, "Ah, God, that doesn't work for me. And they go, well, thanks for coming in. So that was kind of it. But three years ago or so is when I kind of came up with, all right, here's a sequel that I would like to see as a horror fan, as a, as a Jason fan and, you know, putting him in the winter, you know, and putting him in a situation where, He's with these young girls who know nothing about Jason. They came from another state. This is a, a, a winter retreat that they're on, spiritual retreat. So they're a bunch of badass Catholic girls, you know, high school girls with a nun. And I thought, okay, this is, you know, fresh. This is different. And I tried to put a lot of things in there that we haven't seen before. So that's my sequel. So... The day that somebody, you know, says, hey, the lawsuits, you know, been been finally resolved. Whoever has the rights, you know, you know that's who I go to and see if we can make that happen. Do it, man. I want to see that. Do like a, a Halloween 2018 say, thing, like seven, eight, and the rest never happened. Let's go <laughs> directly after six. <laughs> Well, I'm, you know, it is, it, it is a bit of that, of what Halloween did. Um, and that sort of gave me the confidence that go, you know, the audience, they just wanted to see a, a Michael Myers movie. And, you know, it doesn't really matter that the other ones weren't part of the, the canon as they were, uh, because they just thought, no, we want to pick up where we left off. So, I, well, if people were cool with that, I want to make something that's sort of like this legend they, you know somebody found this the, the this story this writings in in like a kind of obscure place so nobody knows if this really happened or not so it's kind of up to you but this happened literally 13 years after he was put down in the lake what caused him to come back up and you know kind of what happens at the end of the movie you know can kind of leave you like that's just a just a cool jason friday the 13th movie and it's not like you know part 13 it may be called that but it, in in truth it doesn't kind of follow that thing but you know we blew him up you know <laughs> had him blew him up and you know he went in outer space and i mean you know he's gone so many different places he's i just very- go back to crystal lake go back to the territory that he knows that the audience knows and do it in that you know 80s 90s style so it, it feels like yeah this is this is the kind of you know friday i love and you know that that's kind of I went. How did um, how did you feel about Seven? Because you can tell that Seven picked up, like, I'm going to say it picked up after Six, even though they changed the name back to Crystal Lake instead of Forest yeah. Green. That's always bugged me. But, <laughs> uh, like, he's down there under the water. He has that, that slit in his jaw from where the boat took out uh, that side of his face. What did you feel about Part Seven? You know, I was I was really curious of what they were going to do. And John Buechler was was such a great guy. I wish he was still with us. But, you know, unfortunately, you know, he passed away, too. But he you know, he was a makeup effects person. And this was a great opportunity for him to go in and just go nuts on the look of Jason, which he did. And it looked incredible. Um I, you know, I was hoping they would carry on with CJ, but, you know, he had a relationship uh, with Kane Hodder. Um, so he wanted to bring Kane in there and Kane brought a whole new kind of Jason too, with the way he, he handled it. So I thought all that stuff, you know, worked really well. Um, and I think they even opened the movie with a bunch of clips from my, you know, part six, which I thought was interesting. You know, they were really trying to set the audience into, okay, here's everything up to, up to now. Um, 
And the, the movie itself, there was things that, you know, I thought were really good. I thought, you know, it was hard to go, well, it's Jason meets Carrie, which was what a lot of people kind of, you know, walked away with. So you're already having to say, okay, this is, this is a movie that sort of exists because there's another type of character that's in there, you know, facing him, uh, which is fine. And I, you know, and I love, love uh, Lars. She's an incredible actress. I got to work on her on my Freddy's Nightmare episode, you know, that I did. Um, so, and, and we're still, you know, very close friends with and see so each other all the time at the conventions. So, uh, you know, there was a, lots of stuff that really worked, but, you know, I guess there were certain aspects in the relationship with the, the mother and the, you know, the, the boyfriend or whatever he was and stuff. There are just certain things to me that just didn't feel like what I think I would have wanted to see in, you know, with it. But at the same time, you know, the, he had so many incredible effects and stuff that were so cut down by the NPAA. I mean, I think part seven suffered more than any of them, you know, they really went after that that movie. So I don't know what it would have been like, you know, seeing it like the way John initially intended it. Um, and it was, it, you know, it was, it was just kind of a, a strange way to kind of bring him back, you know, with this, with this, you know, power that she had. But, you know, if you, if you believe that and take it, you know, take a grain of salt and say, all right, no, I, okay, I'll go with that. I just want to see Jason come back. You know, it, it all works, you know, from that standpoint. Um, with the Freddy's Nightmare episode you did, did you get the opportunity, did you get the opportunity to work with Robert England? Because I know he like opened the episode. I've never seen, it, but uh, I know he like opened the episodes. D did you get a chance to work with him? Yeah, I mean, it was, I do know. Um, they actually had somebody else because he was doing one of those after another. You know, that, so that so he didn't have to work. Uh, day after day or you know just like okay we're going to do all these wraparounds you know for the different episodes so you know I was there I got the medium I got to watch them as they were doing it you know you don't really when you're doing those kinds of things you're not really directing him because he already knows the character they just set up they set up the scene and you know he goes into the you know, it's midnight ah, you know and he does what he does um so, yeah, but it was great to meet him. It was, you know, wonderful to, you know, see him live, you know, with all the makeup and stuff. And, you know, he's also a great guy. That was also fun, you know, just to say hello. Um, big. Hey, Brad. What, Jay? I got I to gotta get headed back in, buddy. Oh, all right. I'll see you later. Hey, Tom, I just wanted to say thank you, man. This is a dream come true for me. Uh, you are a living legend, man. I'm oh. dead serious. I appreciate that. That's I appreciate very nice. Appreciate the chat. With you. This just made my whole year. Thanks. All right. Um, this is the, the All big, right. uh, see you, Jay. This is the big daddy question for me. How did you get Alice Cooper? <laughs> That's great. Um, well, that, that, it's funny because that, that today, you know, literally today that pushes such a button on me because you know, there's a convention that just went on in uh, Las Vegas this weekend, uh, Day of the Dead. And I did the Day of the Dead convention in Atlanta, I guess, about three months ago. So as a result, you know, they didn't have me back for this one in uh, Las Vegas. And CJ's at it. Tom Matthews is at it. And Alice is at it. The truth is, you know, I have not seen face to face Alice Cooper since 1966, when he was Vincent, and he was in a band called the Naz, and I had a band called the Sloss, and we played on the same bill together, you know, and, you know, we were like in our teens back then. And, you know, he was really a cool guy, and he hung out at Frank Zappa's place where I hung out too, and, you know, and I never knew for many years that Alice Cooper was Vincent, you know. So that was, you know, a huge, you know, surprise. Yeah. Then we were um, putting the film together and I was, because I'm a rock and roll guy, you know, I was trying to find all these like cool rock and roll songs to put in there, knowing that we're never going to get the rights. But, you know, I, I put an Alice in there, you know, I put a lot of different heavy metal things in there. Uh, but when Frank Mancuso heard what we were putting in there, he said, what do you think about Alice writing a song? 
I go, you know, you fucking kidding? How? Oh, and he goes, well, his his company, his management, you know, want him to to do something, you know, different. And he loves Jason and, you know, he would like to do that. And I go, that would be great. So, you know, he wrote, you know, Man Behind the Mask and, you know, I loved it. And then said, is there any other songs we might get from him so it can be kind of like an Alice soundtrack? And, you know, what do you want? Teenage Frankenstein and Hard Rock Summer would be great for these two sequences. And we got those. So that all worked out, you know, amazing. But since that time, 35 years ago, anytime I think I'm going to be able to see him, like we were going to cross paths somewhere or go backstage after, you know, a concert, something always got fouled up. So it hasn't happened yet, you know, because yeah. I, I'm, I'm just dying to finally be able to say, man, <laughs> good to see you, you know, after the 60s. Um, but yeah, that's that's still kind of an ongoing thing. But in my band, The Sloss, I do a cover of, um, you know, Man Behind the Mask. And I, you know, kind of go out of my way to do it, you know, as you know, much as Alice voice as I can when we do it. And a fan at one convention told him, he said, you know, Tom McLaughlin's, you know, got a band and he does it. He goes, yeah, man, that's cool. Then, you know, he and I should do it together sometime on stage. And I went, he said that? And I said, yeah, man, that would be all time. That would just be incredible. I would have died, man. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm hoping that happens. Um, do you want to talk about your new uh, TV series that you're directing? Yeah. Um, yeah, I go, I guess it's a week from tomorrow. I you know, go down to Tampa, Florida. And um, we're actually not shooting in Tampa. We're going to be shooting about an hour away in a, in a town called Brooksville. And I picked a house uh, that just happens to be haunted. Um, and I mean, like, seriously been investigated. There's probably, I don't know, 12 to 20, if you go on YouTube, you know, investigator shows that, you know, cover this house. Um, it's called the Saxon Manor. And, you know, if, if you watch these things, you go, you know, all right, are they messing with us or is this real? But there's so many of them and there's so many different reports. You start to go, well, there's something going on there. Um, and I'm one that loves to believe that if it's not ghosts, it's some sort of residual energy or something that goes on that certain people pick up on certain machines, pick up on certain times a camera can pick it up. So them it's it's great because you know film crews coming down there and shooting five nights you know in this haunted house um and our story of course has really nothing to do with the place it's a complete different type of story um which is called the hanging tree and it i i wanted to take something that kind of dealt with racism in a completely different way i'm only setting it in the south because this girl from new york is traveling by car to Tampa and she gets kind of lost and Siri, you know, informs her to go to this place. Um, and then it becomes kind of like the twilight zone. You know, she gets put into, you know, some very um, difficult situations that she really has to kind of let go of her previous beliefs that her father believed and her grandfather believed and the fan, you know, that, that part of racism, that it's not like a choice. It's sort of like it's in your DNA, you know, and, and, she, you know, she has to be faced with some pretty horrific things. And so I'm creating basically our, our scare thing, our scare feature in it, in a, in a way that, I think it should get into people's nightmares. I mean, it, it hopefully that's that's what's happening. But it's a very um, you know, it's it's a half hour series that uh, Dan Merrick, who created Blair Witch, um, is producing. And there's a bunch of us directors that are you know writing or co-writing. This case may be um, you know these episodes that initially I think they're just going to kind of go out on a um, web kind of series way. Um, and then what they're trying to do is, you know, then, you know, sell them to the Netflix or Shutter or something so that they're, you know, like a package, you know, of these half hour uh, anthologies. So none of the stories really, you know, connect the same character, except the series is called uh, The Black Veil. And through the series, you always end up seeing some remnants of a woman in a black veil. 
So that's kind of the ongoing thing and where that plays off. I don't think any of us know yet. I think it's probably back in Dan's head somewhere. So yeah, that's, that's, that's the, that's the story. So I'm, I'm hoping that that'll be like a cool, you know, like just like a short half hour short thing that, you know, can go around and, you know, people can kind of see my, you know, Gothic Southern Gothic side. I like it. Now, um, have you heard about the new Chucky TV show that they're making for sci-fi? No, I don't know anything about that. Actually, I didn't. I, I know. I know they made the recent movie, and yeah. the, guy, the guy who's making the uh, the corpse thing for me did the doll, you know, the new doll. So you know, he's really talented. Uh, you know, incredibly talented. Again, I mean, uh, Eric. Uh, uh, I want to say Rivers. Um, Eric Rivera um, is doing it. And uh, so it's, uh, yeah, it's something that I thought, well, it's probably time, you know, to do a Chucky series. I, I loved the, the Child's Play remake. I thought it was awesome. Um, but they're making a, a Chucky TV show for the Sci-Fi Channel. Mm-hmm. And Don Mancini is going to do it. It's supposed to be a, a, a sequel. Se- it's, it's supposed to t- take place after Cold of Chucky. Uh-huh. And it's like they find Chucky at, um, at this yard sale. And um, uh, this small town start uh, murders start happening in it, and they're trying to investigate who it was. Do you think they already made a Friday the Thirteenth series, but it wasn't about Jason? And you directed one of those personally. Yeah. Do Do you think if they if this rights thing ever ended and the Chucky TV series gets insanely popular? Do you think they should ever attempt to make a Jason-led Friday the 13th show? Do you think it could work? My immediate reaction is no. Um, and I think it's mainly because what we all love about the Friday thing is, is that, that there's something about, you you know, you set up people and you know all of them probably are going to die. You don't know who's going to actually make it. There's always been obviously the theory about the final girl, who's going to be the final girl in my um, sequel. I tried to play with that notion so that in the beginning you go, okay, she's going to be the one that's going to last. And then suddenly she goes and you go, all right, wait a minute, it's got to be this. So I, you know, I'd really try to play with people's imaginations of where they think it's going to go and, and where it actually does. So to try to take that kind of, format that makes these movies work and put it in a weekly series, you know, seems to me really difficult. Now they tried, they, you know, they sat down with Paramount and there must've been 20 people that were all part of the creative team. And everybody was like pulling it, you know, different directions. I think the basic premise was that, you know, there's a series of murders going on in this town and they're chasing all these other people and only like one person knows it's got to be Jason but nobody's listening to him and so I guess every show would have some sort of you know grisly kill and we'd see you know Jason but I you know it's like how do you make that work week after week after week so eventually they 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 folded they just said you know this isn't going to happen or the lawsuit was starting up and they thought well we're not even going to have the rights to do this so we're going to call it quits so i don't know i mean maybe somebody will come up with something really creative there's been a lot of stuff where i went i don't know how you're going to do that and then you go wow i was shocked and i mean they actually made that work so you know it's 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 hard it's a hard call um on that one but i think they're going to try. <laughs> I think whoever gets the rights, they're going to do everything, you know, they can to try to do that because that's kind of what, where we're at now. Streaming is far more lucrative than trying to release a movie in a, in the movie theater um, because so many of the movie theaters now are closed. They've got to reopen. They got to see if there's a market for, you know, young audiences to come again. So everything's kind of in this, you know, we don't know exactly what, but what we do know is the pandemic caused people to stay home and kind of get hooked on being able to binge shows, to be able to see things that, you know, normally would never make, but it's like, no, they've kind of run out of, you know, ideas here. So, you know, they let, let, you know, let's do the guy that raises tigers. Okay, now let's do the, you know, this thing. And I, I mean, they really tried so many different, you know, avenues, and they're still doing that. So, I, you know, I don't know if somebody comes up with something that 
they at least they get the money to get it started and then i guess they see if the audience comes or not yeah did you ever watch the scream series that they made for mtv i, the, I just saw the first one i didn't i didn't see the the others so i, I don't know how that that's uh, that's kind of like what you were talking about how uh, they're supposed to do like a kill every like how they're supposed to make it go every week that show went from an amazing first episode and it just declined after that because I don't I don't really think they can do it. They're trying it with Chucky, but if they can find a way to make it work with Chucky, they might do a bunch of other TV shows. I just don't think it can work. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I I thought with the screen you would be spending the series or at least the first um, you know, um, what do you call it, season trying to figure out which of them is the killer, you know, because you don't really see who the killer is. And so it's a kind of a guessing game through it. Uh, But after that, you know, does it become another person now doing the killing and you do it again? You know, I think audience will start to get bored. And it's not like you can do a bunch of, you know, character development about the killer any more so than you can do with Chucky. I mean, Chucky's Chucky, Jason's Jason. (laughs) No, Freddy's Freddy. Uh, you know, you can do some, some backstory on Freddy, you know. Uh, you know, the, the Brad Durham passed before he went into Chucky, I guess you could do. I mean, but at a certain point, it's kind of like people want to see what they loved about those movies and those characters and not get bogged down too much in backstory and stuff. Oh. What they did with um, Freddy and Freddy's Nightmares, how that first episode was uh, his trial and him getting arrested. Yeah. Um, just what, just like Rob Zombie did with the Halloween remake. I think personally, if you try to go too deep into what makes them crazy or what makes them scary, they're just not scary anymore. Yeah. Yeah. You humanize them so much that you, you know, it, the mystery's gone. The, the you know you you start to realize oh well maybe if I bring up his his mother you know like like they the Friday the thirteenth you know Jason this is mother speaking you know and it stops everything and I was like well, good ploy I mean you know she knew enough to be able to do that and you know and that that was like his his vulnerable spot there like the relationship with his mom um, but you can't do that every single time you know so you got to keep coming up with something else yeah. Do you think that could have worked if instead of going with Jason, they would have just brought back Pamela for part two? Well, she got her head chopped off. <laughs> yeah, but Jason got his head impaled and a machete down through it. I know. You're right. absolutely right. I mean, that that was the whole thing, you know, that I probably had more um, discussion with people over that, you know, the, you know, Jason was theoretically a real flesh and blood person that just was crazy all the way up to part four. And then theoretically he died. And yet part five, you know, he's actually not Jason. He's, you know, this ambulance driver. So when we get to six, you know, I needed to bring him back. And as far as I was concerned, you know, all the supernatural things that you would want to do, you now can do because you got to believe that this, corpse has been reanimated and electrified and unstoppable and i never looked at him as a zombie he's, he's it's always like well, which jasons do you like better you know the real jasons or the zombie jasons and i went I, you know george romero does zombies zombies you know are, to me it's a different breed but i think just the fact that in their mind he's the walking you know dead walking undead um you know that he falls into that category but you know you don't we don't call frankenstein a zombie you know, it's, you know, he's put together parts and electrified and, you know, he's a monster. And I looked at Jason kind of in the same way. He was dead, electrified, and now he's back. Um, and he covers his face with the mask. And, you know, we don't see all the rotted and all that stuff, except as the, you know, the movies went on, they got more and more graphic with how he looked. I'd like to uh, hear your thoughts on this. When we did the, the, the interview with Adam, about, uh-huh. Jason, uh, about Jason Goes to Hell. He had the Necronomicon in the movie. And uh, he was talking to us, and he said that uh, his take on it was going to be that Pamela Voorhees found the Necronomicon, 
and mm-hmm. brought Jason back to life. Like he was dead, but then he she brought him back to for part two before she was decapitated. Um, do you think if they went deeper into that, Jason goes to hell, that could have worked? Great question. I mean, that's really an Adam question more than anything else. I thought it was a cool idea. I think anytime somebody goes, what if we did this, you know, and tried to make, you know, supernatural sense, you know, out of something, um, it, it, you know, if the audience can accept that and go with it, that's what matters. And I mean, I was kind of in that same territory when Tommy was trying to solve how the hell to stop Jason. He's unstoppable. We can't kill him. We can't put bullets in him. We can, you know, so I went back to the old thing that when um, somebody is, you, you know, you can't stop them because they're, you know, a, a ghost or supernatural. You know, we go back to things. And of course, the easiest example is, is poltergeist. You know, you move the headstones, but you didn't move the graves, you know. So all those spirits, all that power was still there. So kind of going along that line, when people have, you know, some sort of entities and stuff, it's because somebody is is buried and it's like they're still angry. And and so they got to get them the hell out of the basement of this house and, you know, put them into religious ground or put them into, you know, where back where they should be um, in the family vault, whatever it is. So I sort of took that idea and said, well, Jason wants to go back. You know, Jason needs to go back to where, you know, he, he first drowned as a boy in the lake. So then I just kind of orchestrated this whole idea of, OK, Tommy's got to figure out some way to get him, you know, down and stay down. And it was the chain and the, you know, the rock, all these sort of you know, basic kind of caveman approaches to it. Um, but I was just kind of fulfilling that kind of classic um, mythology of, of that's how you stop something like that is, you know, put it where it first died or put it where it's supposed to be, you know. And if you buy into that, it, it all works. And I think the audiences just sort of accept that now. It's kind of one of the rules, like, you know, vampires in the sunlight or, you know, stakes or any of that. And when, when they started to move away from that, you start going, well, I thought a vampire, I'm, well, wait a minute, he's holding on to a cross. I thought they were afraid of crosses. Yeah. But as time went on, you know, those rules bent and changed, and then a lot of them just completely went away, you know? And I don't know, I always liked that idea of certain rules and certain things that, you know, somebody could do if they knew how to do it or they knew what the method was um, to stop. But uh, I, you know, I, I think what Adam was was coming up with was a, you know, really cool idea, and it, it would have been, you know, great to see, you know, where that would have continued to go. That this shows how great of a writer you are. You were a really good writer, especially in part six. Like just coming up with that, he has to go back to his. In order to actually kill him, he needs to go back to his resting place. I, I, I always loved that idea. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And and it wasn't like Tommy knew he would kill him, but at least he, he he'd keep him down there. You know, it was like he couldn't get back up and, he, you know, that, that, that he would be chained down there. And, and of course, we get to see his eye open and we realize that rotor thing that that Megan did to him didn't it just, you know, wounded him a bit as as logic would be with setting up the logic that he's unstoppable. And he's just down there waiting. And I. I thought if they never did another Friday the 13th, you're sort of like kind of completing the circle, you know, where you first saw him come up out of the lake in part one. Now he's back down there and, and there he'll say that something happens to resurrect him, you know. I don't know if you ever saw on the internet that guy that built the exact replica and put it down in the lake and had yeah. to change scuba divers go down and take pictures. That was like, to me, the greatest compliment ever, you know. <laughs> The only way you're going to see this thing is you've got to go underwater and check it out. And I thought, what, boy, what a great, you know, adventure that would be. I've always wanted to do that. That that statue looked awesome. It did. This is, you're amazing. You know that. <laughs> um, uh, well, I got well, a, a, another question, and then I'll I, I'll let you go. I know you're a busy man. Um, with part six, um. If you watch like um, rankings or reviews on YouTube about part six in general, 
every ranking has part six at at number two or number one because they always go back and forth with four and six. Yeah. Um, h- how do you feel about six being most people's favorites? Man, Brad, it's like the greatest compliment in the world. I mean, I, as I said, going into it, I was hoping the fans, you know, would would like it, enjoy it, and say, okay, you know, Jason's back. That's cool. Um, but the fact that all, you know, three decades later, I mean, it's, I get so many, you know, requests for, you know, obviously pictures and we just, you know, you know, can I send you a poster? And, you know, every time it's a Friday the 13th, it's like my birthday. I mean, I get hundreds of, you know, happy Friday the 13th. And it's like, how bizarre is this? And I'm incredibly humbled and complimented by that. You know, if, if you ask me, you know, uh, you know, which, which movie do you like better, part four or part six? I'd say part four. That was to me when I watched them all back to back, which I had to do. Um, four was the one that I thought, you know, Joe Zito made a really good Friday the Thirteenth. He ended it with in a kind of a cool way. You know, the characters I liked. I thought all of that, you know, worked really well. You know, I knew I couldn't emulate that. I had to do something different and something that kind of more personal to me with the with the kinds of touches that I put in it. But I kind of loved it. it, sort of bounces back and forth between the one I really like and the one other people like that's mine. So, I mean, to me, both of those are great. And then there's, you know, the hardcore fans that nothing's ever going to beat number one, or some people just are diehard fans for, you know, part uh, three, the 3D one and stuff. And then, I don't know if you know this, <laughs> I, you know, I, I got to know um, just a bit you know, Quentin Tarantino, when we were doing these Masters of Horror dinners that Mick Garris would host. And uh, I was, I went to a screening uh, that we're doing a Friday the 13th, um, uh, like um, festival of stuff at this theater. And, you know, I went to the one with mine because I talked afterwards and stuff. And, you know, as I was, as I was walking out, Quentin was walking and I went, were you here? And he goes, no, no, I'm coming to see part five. And I go, really? He goes, no, look, no offense. Yours is great. Yours, are, yours is great. But part five, man, that is a fucking real slasher, dirty, grindhouse, nasty, bad. I mean, you know, for Quentin, that that was that delivered, you know, the other stuff was like, yeah, it's OK. But <laughs> somehow that was the one. So I thought, you know, this is fucking Quentin Tarantino's opinion. So there you go. Um, where a lot of fans, you know, were disappointed because it didn't you know, do some of the stuff that they hoped. But yeah. I thought that's great that there's, a you know, certainly a big fan there for that, for part five. The take you took with it was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for doing this. Right. This, sure. this, is, this has made my whole freaking decade. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. You know, it was, it was really fun talking to you guys and, you know, Thank you for reaching out. I, I very much appreciate and you know, I always love talking about the movies and, you know, and I really love that you guys are such fans. That's wonderful. Um, don't judge me for having a part one poster. I'm going to get a no, part man, are you kidding? No, that's, uh, that's, that's started at all. I'm, I'm definitely going to get a part six poster. I got that for uh, Christmas a couple years ago. <laughs> all right. Well, you have a great day down there. All right. You too. Thank you. All right, man.